This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. opportunity for me um we've never met i I don't think we've ever even had sort of similar social circles for that matter um we know each other by name no but i think we've met and yeah we've met during a very sad circumstances it was your father's funeral that's that's, where i I met you my memory but i know it's something to dis- disconnect during those times it's not an it's not a happy moment and uh, you get to you try you know you try to forget it most of the time it's exactly the case hence i had no yeah. recollection of that that we actually spoke or even <laughs> even met but but um i think we have we have a f- there's a familiarity and i'm going to mm-hmm. say this up front um the last few days, and it's not just the last few days, but whenever there's this type of news that sort of hits home, um, in a way, I think few people can really understand what it feels like. And at least when it comes to the, the very personal aspect of, of absorbing this news, and I was frustrated. I was sort of trying to focus on work mostly perhaps being a bit too overproductive. And then I get a little message from you saying, a private message, sort of, uh, you're not alone in these thoughts. And, and in a way, you kind of, uh, you measured me. You made me sort of reconsider my output, and I sort of sat back. And uh, I took the liberty to ask you if you'd like to talk about that issue, which you kind of described as a void. And I want to get into this. For a moment, we can disconnect from the politics and all the geopolitics, all the domestic politics, the economic downward spiral, all that aside, just the personal feeling of what it's like to relive these moments. And I'd like to start from your side. And I'm going to, I mean, without getting sort of too personal, and you can say as much as you'd like, um, I think in terms of time, duration, you've probably went through these experiences more than most people I know, simply because after your uncle's assassination in February, 2005, we've had multiple assassinations. On my side, it's since late 2013 that it became very, very personal. And it's only recently that the word assassination is being used again. In particular, Lukman Slim's assassination several days ago. So for you, as somebody who's in a way grown up to this feeling, this recurring feeling, what happens to you when you sort of, when you see it on the news and today it's a different experience, it's Twitter, it's sort of, it's very quick and it's almost very personal in the sense it's in our phone and we're seeing information delivered to us personally. Years ago, it was on the news. We'd all be sitting around with relatives watching the news together. But on your side, just the, the feeling, what is that feeling that comes up whenever this news occurs? Um, it's, as, as I said in, um, in the message, there's a, there's a huge void that you you just live with it. It's um, you know that um, there is this person that was with you all your life, uh, bigger than life, because for most of us, these great men that were assassinated were were relatively bigger than life. And suddenly, with 
they were assassinated. It was, it was another human being who took the decision to terminate a life. And this is, this is what brings a lot of anger because it's not, it's not the natural cycle of life that happened, you know? It's not something that you have no control over. It's somebody who actually planned and to undertake an, an assassination, somebody actually sat for hours and planned and made, a, made reconnaissance and you know, took a decision and recruited people and indoctrinated them. It's, it's really quite an enterprise. But it's also on a on a on a, a personal level you leave you you live the void. Like, yeah. Um, they're no longer there. Um, they're you know you wake up in the some mornings you wake up and you say oh how nice I'm gonna see what my uncle you know it's like what he did today or whatever. Uh, or, you know, you just wake up thinking of them and then you remember that they're no longer there. You cannot reach out. Even if you don't see them, like in my case, he was very busy. I didn't see him on a regular basis, but I know he was there if I right. needed him, if yeah. I wanted to see him, if I wanted to pass by and hug him, he was there. He's no longer there. We don't have that privilege anymore. Um, so when when assassinations happen, I I personally feel like I'm living in a vacuum. I'm not a very emotionally expressive person. Uh, I tend to retreat. Um, maybe um, um, lash out in anger in certain uh, you know against certain people, but. Um, but yeah, it's, it's this vacuum that we live in that we don't want to live the emotions that we went through and we try as much as possible to contain it. But at the same time, we are engrossed in it. We, we're like, it's, I don't know how to explain it, just explain it, but it's like a drop of oil inside a glass of water. You know, it's like it goes down and then up and floats later but it's still encapsulated on its own and this is how this is if this is how it feels whenever you I hear of an assassination um and I try to reach out to people who actually been through this who I know or I have access to because I know they they they're going through it and I know um even if in your case you were overproductive, it's just um, it's just a it's it's a um, um, safety mechanism. Mm -hmm. You're you're protecting yourself from that feeling of of loss, of injustice, of anger, of pain, of grief, because they come, they rush. You know all these feelings; they just gush out, and you don't know what to do with them. It's, it's really difficult. And now with the age of Twitter and the age of, of you know, everything is, is documented, it's even harder because I, I in the case of Luqman, I, um, a friend sent me a message. She's like, Luqman disappeared. And then she sent me a message, they found him dead. I, I don't know Luqman, I've never met Luqman. I've, I've read some of his writings, I've seen him on TV. Uh, and then an hour later, I get a message from my friend in Egypt and he says, my cousin was killed. Mm. And I'm like, I never made the connection. Yeah. And honestly, I just stared at, at my phone and I'm thinking, okay, no, how could he be his cousin? You know, that he's in Egypt. This is right. an, you don't do the connection. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know how to um how to reach out to you, but just it, it's it's just shocking because now it brought it closer because this is my friend. 
he lost somebody, he knows what it is. And he sent, he actually, he sent a message, I was, he, he, another a second message saying, um, I'm thinking of you and your family. And we, we had a, you know, it's, it's, it was surreal. And um, it makes, you know, it makes mo you more angry at, about, about these assassinations, especially in Lebanon. Um, and, and then you see the pictures, you know, the photos all over the social media and, and social media and uh, main, uh, mainstream media. And you, you think, I mean, how inappropriate that could be? Because I know until today, um, the assass my uncle's assassination photos have affected me so much seeing him, um, seeing his photos and all of that. So I know how, it, it's something that marks you. You cannot get, you know, it's not an image that you can live without. Because on one hand, you only want to remember that person, the happy person that you've known him. You don't want to remember him, the person that lost to evil. And these you images bring them back. I don't think I've ever had this conversation before. I'm not thinking about it. These details that you're expressing, I didn't I don't appreciate that I I do this all the time. You know, I didn't I didn't think about this that the recurring imagery of death of a loved one and you trying to shield yourself from that imagery although it's impossible. It's simply impossible to to remove it, you'd have to properly disconnect from the planet. And that's just doesn't doesn't happen. Yet you're trying to over override that by going back to your own personal memories that are not public, they're cherished. I don't think I've ever exactly. really I don't think I've ever thought of it, thought of it this way. And I like that you're emphasizing the human aspect to this loss. I uh, I did the same thing. I messaged other people. Um, Mezen, Mezen Hassan, uh, Wissam al Hassan's son, who's been on the podcast twice. We messaged each other without saying much. It's just a, an acknowledgement. A, almost, a, almost a timely hello with, with exactly. no words necessary. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I did something. I messaged Lukman's wife. I don't know if she saw the message. I'm sure she's overburdened by everything at the moment, but I reached out to her, just just letting her know. But I think uh, I think these are the very few ways people that have gone through this type of violence. These are the the limited options you have of sort of support because there isn't much of it. No. And I and I think that uh, yeah, I just never never really talked about these things and. Uh, I, oh, sorry. Yeah, because when you right. when you see these pictures, you it's it's dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. It's dehumanizing the victim who's a loved one, mm -hmm. and us, you know, who loved lost loved ones. We want to keep on remember them, remembering them as humans. You know, not as politicians or activists or journalists this is this is their job this is this is not what they are this is a job this is not the person the human right. that we this is this is yeah. one component of the personality that they are yeah and you know it's and when you do humanize them you just put them in one compartment and you don't see anything else and this is what's and today, you know, when when you when you read like the the the, the whole uh, the timeline on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, um, you get you get angrier because this person is somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's father, somebody's husband, somebody's friend. And he's been malignant in a way that is utterly 
disrespectful to human nature. It was, it's rude and just, you know, it's, it's beyond any human, basic human decency. Are, sorry, Rina, are you talking uh, about, are you talking about the, uh, is it, is it not less the celebration, the, no, more the crit criticism of, of his? Criticism, yeah, exactly. Right, right. Of yeah. his legacy, you yeah. know, it's like you can wait for that. You know, if you and and unfortunately, in in our part of the world, uh, very few criticism is done is based on some objective criticism based on somebody's work and achievements. Uh, criticism in in our in in our communities, uh, the, the different communities of Lebanon is very personal. The bashing that's going on and this, this, the, cele the celebration is, is a whole different level of actually dehumanizing the victim. Let me ask you, I want, I want actually, I, I haven't had the chance to talk about that issue in particular. And for me, and I want you to tell me if, if you see it this way or not, for me, this still remains on the margins, but Twitter, or at least social media makes it seem like it's driving the story. So in, in, in other words, uh, shared clips that are perhaps taken out of context, or even for that matter, uh, quotes that are misattributed, or certain leader's son who publishes a tweet and then removes it. Um, for you, is that, is that a something that is front and center? after the assassination or is it is it something that's so fringe yet when you see it and because it's being shared you feel like it's sort of it's driving the story i i still i would still like to think the average person is is in a way suffering as well that they're seeing a murder a political crime take place in a country that's losing itself and that should that should be a shared pain so uh, can you tell me if this resonates with you or not whether or not you see that as sort of the overall picture or or is it that the the malicious voices are driving the story i i will i will i will divide my answer into two the first is the sphere of twitter and social media um which is actually the outlet in which these um expressions are happening right yeah um and that sphere it it just it's another form of uh, tribalism we create our own Twitter tribes and, um, and we raid the other tribe and see what they're saying and pick it up and you know, blow it out of proportion and use it the way we want our, our followers or people with the same background, the same identity, the same characteristics that we follow, mm. this looking at, it's, a, it's really a very primitive, um, tribal behavior of raids against each other on mm, Twitter. Mm. And this, it has a, an echo effect, um, a, a shred of a reflection of, of the society as a whole, if we want to take Lebanon as, as, a, as a, of, of the increased, because of this uh, media tribalism that we're mm. living, we 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 will feel more an increase in identity politics, and basically building our our, our identity, building one's group's identity against the set, the other, based on the differences, uh, based on dehumanizing them, based on demeaning, you know, uh, demeaning them. Uh, because we we think we're shielding ourselves, and you know it's us versus them in the pure sense of things. So you're in a way, Twitter uh, is the worst aspect of Lebanese society gone yeah, it, wild. It, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because you know it's like uh, I've been on Twitter since it started, and I've I'm I'm not. I'm active, but not really. Like I'm not a Twitterati. It's like I check it all the time. Yeah. I have a thing that I actually look at um, the responses and who's responding to whom, and you can make connections that these people they respond to each other. 
they have a conversation. It's like making subhiyya together. <laughs> it's like, honestly, like one would make, put a tweet, the other would answer. And, and then you have those who, are, who come raiding from the other tribe who, are, who puts, you know, who attacks. And then yeah. th- th- those who ro- go back and attack a certain comment from that tribe. So it's, it really, it really, it, it, it optimized our, our structural, and it's not structural differences, but our, our identity differences in Lebanon. Can I ask um, you, I'll just interrupt. Might, Sorry, yeah. I just want to interrupt, Lena. I, I take liberty yeah. here at interrupting. I rarely sort of, yeah, I, I, it's a, it's no a personal thought. subject. I, when you see when you see your last name and it's probably the most well recognized lebanese family name in our sort of our generation i mean that's it's inescapable when you mm-hmm. see when you see your family name reference to your uncle so it has nothing to do with you but it's a relative who's being sort of tweeted about do you think in the last or since you've been on twitter so you've been on from the beginning. Mm. Do you think that the public opinion has gone more tribal to your last name because of that scenario? And the reason I'm asking you in this particular question, I think the last name Hariri, the way I remember it in 2005, six, maybe even a little later, seven, is a very different last name today. And I don't think, I don't think it's because of the I don't think it's because of Saad Hariri. I think it's it's social media has done something to that name too. In other, what I'm saying, I'm being very careful here. It's not a critique. It's not a sophisticated criticism. It seems like it's bashing and continuously bashing. And most of that, I see it online. So I'm wondering, does that fit yes. the paradigm here? That it's like, in other words, things that were not tossed around like that before are now... No, always, they're... they're- yeah. The, because also there's two reasons behind it. First of all, they hide behind the anonym, anonymity of their of their yeah. account, and they believe that um, it's it's a way of exp- not expressing as in freedom of speech, but if it's a way of marking, it's mm-hmm. it's something that would give them a, a boost for their self esteem. If I bash this person who uh, who's you know, you can agree with what he did, with what he didn't, but he put Lebanon on the map. If I bash this person who's, you know, bigger than than life, I am somebody who can do anything. And uh, they hide mm-hmm. behind mm-hmm. their enmity. It gives them a boost. Um, the other way, is, the other, those who don't, that they don't feel ashamed of bashing it, it's also, a, a, you know, it's, it's this... Um, it's not a democratization per se, but it's a way of, you know, the social media opening up uh, ways of expression that were not available before. You know, I'll you go know, a step further it, in this because I, it's something that I've reflected on myself without having really talked about it. And I sort of, my memory of criticism towards Rafi Hadidi, not, not Saad Hadidi, because that's, maybe that's, that's a different era, but the the Rafi Hariri, the criticism was never vitriolic the way it is now. And I think there's an unfairness that has sort of emerged where there's no fact checking. And oftentimes it seems like it's going down the path that you're describing, which is there is a sense of power online where you sort of you're able to lob accusations. And rarely does anyone really take the take the time to see whether or not these are true or, or false. And they pick up. This could be on the worst end of the spectrum, conspiratorial lies that are just false allegations. At the best side, if there's one here, it's maybe an attempt at what you're saying, democratization, but it's, it doesn't last. It becomes tribalistic and then it becomes, in a way, it's, it's almost like a, um, these people are bad, period, power, bad, and then we have sort of this craziness online that removes the crime from the story. And I think, I think that happened, that happened quicker. Going back to repeated assassinations, it took some time 
to actually have that criticism building up, whether it was fair or unfair. But now, now, Lukman Slim, I think what you're describing happened within maybe minutes of the of the murder. Exactly. Yeah, and exactly. I think that's yeah, that's that's new. That there's no patience. It's almost you know, it's there within seconds. The the bad. We can end. do it. We'll do it. Right. Right. It's like it's you know it's oh I can I will. I, but, there's no afterthought for it. But how do you how do you shield your emotions from that? And I mean it in, in an individual way. I went the extremely productive route, which you described so well. This is a safety mechanism. How do you shield yourself bef- before you reach out to others, before you sort of want to comfort loved ones or even friends or virtual friends that you've never, that you've met maybe once? How do you protect yourself from that? It's not easy. You know, you, you build a fixed skin you keep repeating, you know, reminding yourself, this is not the truth. You said it, we have a problem with fake news and the fact checking. Mm. And, and this is, has nothing to, you know, it's not about the major issues in the, in the, in, in the country, but it's also about little things with your aunt's WhatsApp group. Like I remember I spent the first lockdown fact checking everybody sending me anything. <laughs> At the end, I'm like, you know what? You want to believe that the virus came from the moon? Fine with me. Just go oh. ahead. I'm <laughs> done. I'm done with fact checking. I'm not doing it anymore. It was a full moon and COVID struck us. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like, I'm done. And this is the problem. People no longer, although we have all the tools that, you know, in this time and age, the technical and the accessibility to fact check anything we want, mm-hmm. we're too lazy to use it. The tools meaning that you can actually go to You can the... access anything and look for, for you know, for fact checking. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. did this happen, that? Did this... And if you don't need to do... You don't, you know, you don't need to, to go to archives. You don't need to go to libraries. You don't need to read, you know, a hundred book for, for you to actually understand if this is, mm-hmm. this is a right, uh, you know, this is a correct uh, information or not. It's inf- the correct information and the ability to know what is correct and what's fake is on the, f- it's on your fingertips. It's just a click away. And people just don't do it because it's also, it's also, it's a kind of, um, it's, it reinforces certain beliefs. And this is how people, you know, they, they tend to, um, you know, if they think this is, this is the truth, they tend to unconsciously lead themselves into all the information even if it's not a true information but it's easier for the brain to process something that you cognitively thought it is true and and process it it's also if you tell them it's not true a lot of people might take a lot of you know individuals might you know if you challenge their beliefs whether in information, I'm not talking about great beliefs in God or religion or the existential questions. I'm talking about little things about, you know, the person you believe saved you, the person you believe helped, the person you believe, you know, make, he's making a difference. If you, or, what, or you don't believe he's doing that. If you challenge it with facts, they will retreat behind, um, they will take it personal as a personal attack. Right, right. And they will retreat again behind it and yes. they will only look for people that are similar to them and that believes in the same facts, whether correct or erroneous, you know? Do you think this has happened to every assassination? Meaning there's an impression which is often false and there's no... Th- I mean, with the exception of a very, very important marker, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon and its verdict, that that issue, which ma- which means something, it's important, but that justice was never really given its its due chance. That that the victims 
never really got to see criminals or or you forget the victims the country never got to see criminals of of that scale held to account and then you have these these voices that are just spewing lies the way you described do you sense that this is sort of taken a life of its own that that because the facts have not been measured with accountability people get away with this and and sometimes impressions dominate this fear even when we all know that they shouldn't and even when we know the special tribunal issued a verdict and a thousand page report to back it people are still sort of dubious about it they're like well it's almost like we don't really know and would rather search our answers on online among impression among among our communities the way you described it our online tribes do do you think that has become a, a fact we I mean, we live in a, in a country that since its inception, there was no ac- accountability to any political assassination. We got this uh, special tribunal for Lebanon. The special tribunal for Lebanon delivered a professional verdict based, you know, on, you know it, it gave us, a, it revealed an irrefutable truth. Mm-hmm. But this is the role of a tribunal to give a verdict, it will right. not, you know, if you don't implement and enforce that judgment, um, it's accountability is just, you know, it's, it, it, it's not reached. Right. And in Lebanon, because of, um, because of, of, of a, a relatively failed state, um, enforcing a, uh, a judgment from from the STL will not be easy because you have a group, um, um, an armed group in the country that actually worked for the four, past four decades religiously and tire- tirelessly to undermine the state, whether the state institutions or the state sovereignty it undermined it and it gives them, um, they believe that it gives them a higher moral ground to do whatever they want. It's not more, it's immoral ground rather than a moral ground, huh. but they believe that, you know, they're, they're better, better than you because they can, you know, they, they can pull themselves together and they have a more of you as the state. Uh, They have more organized social uh, health institution than the state's military to a certain extent uh, than the state. So they believe they can, they can. These are, these are Lebanese people like us, but they, they have a drive that is different than the, than this, another group in this country that believes in the state, believes in state institutions, Believe in in uh, in 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 state legitimacy by providing services by providing basic ba- basic uh, services, but this group that is militarized and that's actually um, took decisions to end other people's life because they're different from them. Um, they don't believe in that, and these are people that are Lebanese, just like you and me. And this is where the difficulty arises, is that you are dealing with another group of Lebanese who, I'm not gonna use the word because I'm, I, I, I use tribes. I don't wanna use confederate, confederation of tribes. I'm not gonna use <laughs> federation of con- confederation. <laughs> it, takes, it goes on a, on a different level of understanding, but, but you know, it's like, our, our Lebanese umbrella, that we all live under that. And, and it's not, you know, it's, it's difficult to, um, to see how we can get to certain level of accountability. Uh, because without ac- accountability, you will never build trust you know, people need to trust in their system. They need to trust that if somebody did something wrong, they need to be punished. 
I fully agree on that point. And I always drive that issue home, which is you cannot throw away justice. It's not a way you move on from war. If you throw that principle away, you embrace permanent war. And I, I always make that an issue at any any moment I can. And you brought up something that, you know, the it's another, another issue I haven't thought of regularly. I've thought of it from time to time, but I dismiss it. But you're bringing it up in a way that's healthy. I, I try not to think about the other. I try not to think of the human individuals that planned out these multiple attacks. I, I don't know if this is the right, right way to do it or wrong. And I try whenever reports come out where there's names listed or it's the tribunal that sort of everyone knew their names. I try not to even look at their photos. I don't, I don't think I even want to know what they look like. And I guess, I guess maybe that is the wrong way to do it. Maybe the right way is to do it the way you were hinting at, which is see them as fellow Lebanese and, uh, and treat them as such, but always make sure that their crimes are held to account and don't deny them that. Yeah. But there's another issue, there's another level in this uh, also, is that they are fellow Lebanese. But you have to keep in mind that these people are indoctrinated. And one of the things that they're indoctrinated about is the, the dehumanization of the other. Mm, mm. The people that are like you and me, like my uncle, your father, uh, which makes them legal targets for elimination. And this is, I, I mean, Luqman's mother said, said something very important in her amazing interview, is that the instigators yes. are, as, uh, are even more responsible than those who pulled the trigger. Right, right. And this is it, this, the, you can, propaganda is such a, such a powerful tool and fear mongering is even more powerful. And this is what, what every tribe tries to uh, enact is like, you know, the other is going to take away your rights. The other mm -hmm. is going to take away your work, the other. And we see it, we see it in Lebanon on a very small, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Yeah dealing with refugees, dealing from people from other sects, from other regions, from other neighborhoods. The, the concept of the other is so entrenched in our, in our identity and, you know, subconscious that it's really would, would take tremendous effort to actually try to um, detangle all the evilness out of it. And so make it human again. Right. So it's almost almost applying the it's the ills of war and applying that on them. That they're going by exactly. Yeah, right. That they're and that, and, yeah. the, and the fact, you know, the the fact that um each the, the, these these communities, they they close, they're so introverted, you know, xenophobes, um, they 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 cocoon against each other. It's what makes it very difficult to uh, break uh, break away or to to find a, a, a common ground for for communication and dialogue. And it happened post civil war when you know people from the east side and the west side met and they discovered, oh, you have five fingers on each hand. I have five <laughs> fingers on each hand. <laughs> You're just like the same as me, you know. It's like uh, so. Or no, actually, some if of it, them it would be more appropriate in that context. You have four fingers. I have four fingers too. We both survived the war. Let's embrace. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah and and this is it but but the but the you know the the concept of accountability especially in 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 political assassination is very important not not just for the the healings of the 
families of the victims, uh, at the end of the day, nothing will bring our loved ones back. It's they're not they're not coming back. But it's it's a healing process. It's a it's a national healing process. And it's one that we haven't had. We but, never and, had. Right. And and I I'm I'm curious from your side. Uh, there's this hesitation in Lebanon, I think, to just focus on the crime when talking about the crime itself. There's this deliberate attempt to, to just dilute, dilute it with everything else. And, I, and I'm give, giving you a, a personal example that I've encountered regularly. The assassination of Rafi Hariri, Solidaire. It's almost like the two um, the assassination of Rafi Hariri, public debt. The assassination of Rafi Hariri, 1980s relationships with all these different players. The assassination of Rafi Hariri, oh, well, anything you want. It's almost like, you know, no, no, you but end I, up I, including Rafi Hariri died in a car accident. Exactly. And, yeah. and it's almost like, uh, those were the things that even if you if you desperately disagree with, if you despise Sully there until you die, you cannot apply your disdain for a reconstruction rehabilitation private enterprise, which is still perhaps a controversial subject, but nonetheless, that has nothing to do with the assassination. And there's that, it's it's a it's I think political assassinations are the issue, that these are politics and then the crime is sort of thrown in there as if the crime is secondary which should not be the case i'll give you a, a personal example um this is within maybe a day or two after my father's assassination coming from the usual suspects that we know they're sort of online and they're they're a bit trollish yeah uh saudi arabia supporter saudi arabia suddenly becomes part of the story you know even robert fisk wrote an obituary and it's almost the front, I think it was the first line, the Saudi backed sort of like a, you're trying to put something on a crime. And you know what, as far back as I can remember, the word Saudi Arabia and my father's work, if they ever met, it was met through diplomacy, but that's not even the story. It's that the crime happened because this man had a relationship with somebody who had a relationship with Saudi Arabia. And then the crime, the crime becomes like a after fact. It's, it's, the, it's the irrelevant when it should be the most relevant part of the story. And, and, and you know, it should be also localized. And it should be exactly, a, yes. And the emphasis on the local, I think, is important when addressing a local crime because the crime happened in a local entity called Lebanon. So what? If you can dance around the subject endlessly with other issues, it, doesn't, it shouldn't matter. It has, that. it has a, yeah, it has yeah. a, it has a very, it has a very important geopolitical regional component that mm -hmm. cannot be denied, mm -hmm. but it also has, a, you know, local calculations that right. you know you have to take into account. Yeah, and and it's these and the differences between these two camps is very structural. And it's become it's probably very more... structural. Yeah, and it's exactly. more structured now than ever. Yeah. And this is what we need to look at. Yeah, sorry. You know, Please. but when I look at what happened to in 2005 and all the assassinations that happened after that, after, I can, I can understand why we are here today. I want to ask. Yeah, why I... we reached that level. Okay, let's let's go down this road together, and we'll 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 push forward as much as we'd like on each other's terms. I agree. I think it's easier now to point the finger. It's easier to put the burden, and I think I will guess here. There is a majority of Lebanese that don't want this arrangement with Hezbollah whether they're ready to say this openly, whether they're even able to do something about it, I don't know, probably not. But that there are enough Lebanese that now accept 
the fact that Hezbollah is responsible for not just a few, but probably all of the assassinations and attempted assassinations since 2004 until three days ago. So, and the fact is that there's, there's an openness to saying it now that, I, that is unusual. Whether it's at Samir Asir a few days ago with a woman shouting it from the top of her lungs, whether it's Mona Fayyad, I think it was on LBC the day of or the night of the assassination, or anyone. Makram Rabah tends to be loud anyway. He's louder than ever. And I think the average person is capable of saying that Hezbollah is at least indirectly or directly uh, responsible for all of these repeated crimes. Does that offer any reassurance to you? Knowing that we can now say that we reached where we are today, largely because the structure was flawed to begin with, and they paid, they were largely responsible for the, for the failings of post-war Lebanon. They're not the only group responsible, but they have, a, they have a primary burden. They have a primary burden in bringing us to where we are now. Does it help hearing Hezbollah accused? Does it actually help in that, yes, so much money and time and effort and patience was taken for the special tribunal's verdict. They accused a Hezbollah operative, but now Lebanese are accusing Hezbollah too. Is there anything there on a, on a personal level for you? I, I'm, a, um, I'm studying to be a historian. So archiving is one of my things. Anything that is, you know, this, the STL statement, even if it's not, you know, the, the, the report that the in, in indictment that happened, even if it's not going to be enforced, it's going to stay there in history. A mm. mm. hundred, two hundred years from now, mm -hmm. it's going that one thousand page report. Somebody will read it. Those Twitter tweets that are done, those videos that are done, those podcasts that are done, these are form of archiving for our lives today. And for the, for the, you know, for, for the future, these are all documents and all material, primary material that actually whoever comes 50, 60, 70, 100 years from now doing a research on Hezbollah, they have enough material to actually know and pinpoint and make a change. Now, you tell me, I don't care about what the future I want. I want it now. I want, <laughs> you know, I want my salvation now. I want to get, you know, talking about the elephant in the room. It's like, it's like in psychology, the first step into your therapy is acknowledging that you have a problem. <laughs> and people are acknowledging that they have a problem now. And that problem is Hezbollah. But so there's an admission that is that's the first step in the long road to looking back and and pinpointing this structural problem that we're not exactly. we're just at the first step okay yeah but it's very important also to wonder and question what can we do to make a difference what can we do to solve that problem um, the easiest way is to have another civil war, but no one is, you know, we're all fatigued, not mm -hmm. just from civil war, from our everyday issues. People yeah. don't want to be resilient anymore. They are, but they don't want to, because being resilient is, is although it's a Lebanese moda operandi, but it's not the norm to, ha to carry on with your life. Right. You know, you, I, I mean, we both lived outside of Lebanon when we hang out with our friends, non-Lebanese friends. You know, sometimes I just hide and say, because I cannot talk about childhood memories <laughs> when we were in the shelter from the bombs. They look at me, it's like, where do you, what, what planet do you come from? You know, where, where they had their childhood was colonies de vacances and camping and I don't know where. I'm like, camping? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you should just say that was your way of camping. You were in a exactly. shelter, you know, hiding from the world. Yeah. No, but I, I agree. So so we're at the first step now, but it'll take a historian later to to do 
to look through the record that we've left behind. And that could include Lukman Slim's words, which win long term. Actually, look, Lukman Slim's work is, is at the center of this. Yeah, actually, that's true. Collective it memory. Is this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, speaking of collective memory, post uh, Beirut blast, when I went back to London, we had a dinner once, a, a whole, the whole Lebanese group that we are. And at the end of the dinner, we realized that um, we spent most of the dinner talking about where were you during that event during the civil war and that event during the civil war. And this is our collective memory. Yeah. And, you know, the, I, you know, you can't use the word beautiful, but the beautiful thing about that discussion is that each one of us came from a different region of Lebanon, from a different part of Lebanon, a part that was under the control of a different militia. Mm-hmm. And each talked about the same event in a different way. Right. Yeah. That's because actually that's quite nice. They lived it in a different. Yeah. Yeah. And and this is it. But if we want to go back to you know, it's not about documenting and keeping things for future for somebody else to come in. But it's also, you know, acknowledging the problem and finding ways to deal with it. And the finding ways to deal with it structuring it is is the most difficult part because yeah. that is that is a learning process um that is um a, it's a process that will need a lot of people to shed a lot of identity traits that they were hiding behind in order to find common grounds in order to find ways of, of, of building, you know, to build blocks of unity and, and to form um, entities that actually will survive and will make a difference um, in the future. You know, I, I remember a few years back when, when Hezbollah started sending uh, uh, um, troops to 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 Syria yeah. and I remember I saw one picture online of two kids because I'm pretty sure they weren't more than 18 years old one on a wheelchair uh, with no legs and a second person hugging him with only one arm because he lost the other these are combatants that came back from uh from Syria and my first reaction was how are we going to appease the anger and the hate that will grow within these two children against the other Lebanese who did not go and fight did not lose his limbs and this is this is fundamental because and 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 whoever instigates that this this um, this ethos in this group of people, the people who run them, um, I'm pretty sure they know they know that that one day they will not be able to maintain the 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 gluing factor of fear that keeps that community together, and this is where you will have a, a real a huge societal problem. And this is the post-war I, generation. Oh, it's amazing that this is, it's so incorrect now to say the post-war generation. This is a generation that, that has grown up fighting, indoctrinated, and at war. So it, it's almost a mis, misnomer to apply post-war. Yeah, but you, yeah. you see the post post-war generation and post-civil Lebanese war generation, part of them were able to pick up their lives. Yeah, move right. On. Yeah. But you have, you still have one part of that are still living in the civil war generation. Right. And these are, these are the, the people that are being sent to come back in body bags from Syria. 
their fodder to a conflict that, you know, that has, it's a bottomless conflict, no end to it, no end near, no, no end near. Um, and it will, it will affect, um, it will affect a lot, uh, you know, the, the, the social fabric of Lebanon in a sense, uh, when that glue is, and, and when we lose, when they lose that, that gluing factor of fear and, and, you know, hating the other, but, it's, I believe it's, uh, it's, on, it's on, on those who actually, well, nowadays you cannot say with everything that they, that those who actually live life, love life, uh, it's, on, it's their responsibility to make, to make room and to prepare for that moment of collapse. Because you need to include those others in you. The, uh, and I'm not talking about the leadership. The leadership. Sure, is sure, of course. No, that's, this is no. actually, yeah. I'm, this is I'm talking about the little guys, yeah, the yeah. little people, the, 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 the woman who lost her husband, the, the mother, the child who grew up orphan, you know, the, these people, you know, people that are that want to get an education, they want to get work, they want to be independent, they want to learn, they want to have basic health and, and all basic needs, like everyone, every each one of us. I want to ask you a very delicate question, and I'll wrap it up with this question. And it's something that I've been curious about myself, because I've been asked it regularly, and I don't have a I don't have an eloquent answer. And I've been trying to navigate this this thought, whether or not in an ideal situation where there is some reconciliation and a future Lebanon that is able to wobble and perhaps stand on its own two feet one day, would you be able to make peace with Hezbollah? Meaning, meaning, if there were a situation where this is necessary to move on for the country to heal, and this is only one chapter of our history. There has been repeated conflict. It's not just a relationship between Hezbollah and the victims of those assassinations. But I'm talking about just our own limited experience. Would you be able to turn the page? And the reason I'm asking you, and I'll say from my side up front, I would not be able to turn the page with an armed Hezbollah. What I would be able to do is turn the page with an evolved group whether or not they retain the name is none of my concern. But this version of Hezbollah, there's nothing you can do with in terms of reconciliation and, and acceptance. This is not a normal situation. And I used the reference to the IRA, that there was never any, no one was ever forced to accept reconciliation with an armed group. They reconciled in a post-war environment that was largely disarmed. The Balkans had the same situation. There's no paramilitary force where the victims are asked to sort of hold hands once more. It's pacified. I can accept a pacified Hezbollah, but I cannot accept an armed Hezbollah. And I was wondering if you saw it differently or, or maybe no, the same way. I mean, you cannot, you, cannot, it's, you cannot accept an armed Hezbollah and, and talk about reconciliation. Mm. It defeats the purpose. Yeah. You want you want a reconciliation. You'll have a reconciliation when all the population are equal in their right, actually, and their obligation not to carry arms. Yeah. The arms should be within the within the reach under only under the state. Like only the state has allowed to have to to have and possess arms within the army and the and the police forces. Other than that. Is a, it defeats the purpose of having a reconciliation when you have somebody who has an upper hand just because he has arms. The acceptance that Lebanon is a country for all its citizens with all their diversification, with the, all the varieties, with all their sects, with all their differences. It's our country and there's no room for exclusion there's no room for um 
annihilation of one group or another. This is this is the this is the space that we have. You know, there's you can no longer make nation state. The days of nation states creation is over. So we cannot. We have no other option. This is it. This is what we have, and this is how what we need to deal with. As someone who's uh, studying the past and pursuing a PhD on West Arab Ottoman history, I hope I got that right, or Western Western Arab, Arabia, Western Arabia, Western right? Western Arabia, Western Arabia. Sorry, yeah, Western Arab wouldn't make sense. Sorry, shows you why I, I skipped my PhD. But an Ottoman uh, dissertation, um, and and also that appreciation of uh, of the past, right behind you is the sort of the old lira. Uh, display, which I, I have my own <laughs> version of at home. Yes, yeah, so I like that. I would like to do another episode later, touching on your 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 work and your research. And I, I appreciate you letting us just explore the rawness of what it what it's what it's like to live through these moments repeatedly, the uh, the pain and the void and and everything that has gone wrong in recent years when it comes to accountability and justice. It's a it's an emotional topic and conversation, but I, I I like that I could talk about these things with you, and we will also next time talk about your podcast, which has been on hiatus a little yeah. too long. I know I've been very yeah I've been very very lazy about that. You've been productive. I haven't. It's part of me uh, uh, hiding actually hibernating. <laughs> But you know, I need to pick, I even brought my, my research with me. I was like, you know what, since I'm staying in Lebanon for two more weeks and not leaving my pa- parents' house due to Corona, um, I might as well work on something. <laughs> I'll say this, somebody who's done nearly 250 episodes, you have the voice for it and you have the pace and you also have the right references. Salim Deringel, he was a pr- professor of mine at AUB. When I noticed his name showing up on your reference list, I was like, I have to listen to this. So I, I yeah. hope you keep the podcast going, but we'll talk about these things another time. It deserves an hour mm-hmm. on its own. But uh, speaking speaking of, of my PhD, I just need to tell you this. When I decided to do a PhD, it wasn't about history at mm. the beginning of it. It was about uh, pol- politics, international affairs. And the first person that I went to to actually ask him ask his opinion about history was your father oh oh wow uh yeah I went I took a meeting um we had a great talk my um the plan was I was I was I was planning to do a history about um Turkish foreign policy but then I realized that you know what before looking into the present I need to look into the past Oh wow! But I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that meeting quite well. So you can blame all your pain and agony of your dissertation <laughs> process on my father. It's, <laughs> why did I listen to this man? <laughs> no, that's that's a very nice story. I had, I did not know that. Uh, that's yeah. actually it's very sweet. The um the other person was uh, Jean Bed. Actually, we just lost him today. You're kidding. Uh, yeah, so, the other person that I actually went to see. Wow. I mean, this but is I a, don't regret their advice, both of them. I, I I'm sure. Well, I look on, on my side as somebody who started and never finished a PhD. Uh, the topic, at least when it came out in the podcast, the way you delivered the the material and the research, I really enjoyed it. And Salim Deringel, he's one one reference note, but he was probably my favorite professor at AUB. I don't know where mm-hmm. he is now. I have no idea if he's still in Lebanon, but uh, but no, I, I think it's a dissertation that's worth pursuing. And you know what? It's our shared history, and it's some. It's a, we don't. I don't think we. I don't think we fully appreciate how beautiful our recent past was, let alone our distant past. And I think uh, I think it's all the more worth celebrating, given how painful things are at the moment, and. I look forward to talking about that subject yeah. with you. So thank you, Rina. And you know we what? We should actually. We, we definitely should. will. And oh, I'll get thank I'll you get so much. I'll get my Lira display on next yeah. time. So, and my little Ottoman flag as well. We, yeah, we full, need to. Full <laughs> well, I don't know when we're gonna film the other one, but you might not have it anymore because oh. I'm actually squatting in my mom's office. <laughs> so by the time we do if <laughs> 
I'll go to some storage and pull them out and just tape them on the wall here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rena. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.